Massachusetts had ratified the Constitution. As the most important state in New England, Federalists hoped that the remaining states in the region would just see the writing on the wall and ratify the Constitution in their upcoming debates. New Hampshire's convention began just a few days after Massachusetts adjourned. Like Massachusetts, the towns of New Hampshire had a strong tradition of critiquing and rejecting their state constitution. When the Articles of Confederation were submitted to the towns for approval, some towns complained that New Hampshire would be giving up too much of its independence if it ratified. If they felt that strongly about the Articles of Confederation, they would need some serious convincing to accept an even stronger central government under the Constitution. When Shays' Rebellion swept across Massachusetts, towns in western and northern New Hampshire made similar petitions to the state legislature for tax relief and paper money to make it easier for farmers to pay off their debts. Things came to a boil when the legislature tried to repeal a law that prevented the British from collecting debts owed by New Hampshire citizens. This law was in violation of the Treaty of Paris, and it was one of the reasons that the British were occupying American territory and arming hostile Indian nations in the West. The New Hampshire Assembly was trying to play nice with the federal government, but ordinary citizens didn't care about western forts and faraway Indian wars. They wanted debt relief now, and it looked like the legislature was ignoring them in favor of British creditors of all people. Insurgents marched into Exeter, where the assembly was in session. They wanted to keep their protections from creditors and pressure the assembly into printing paper money. New Hampshire's president, John Sullivan initially promised to let the people protest as long as they remained peaceful, but in private he was looking for a way to disperse them. He turned to the people of Exeter, who, turns out, were not happy that their town was being occupied by rioting farmers. So they organized the militia and chased them out of town. The farmers failed to enact any of their demands, so their problems continued. Even worse for them, the new constitution that came out of the federal convention forbade the states from issuing paper money and forced their state to abide by treaties made by the federal government and foreign nations. President Sullivan called a special legislative session in Exeter that would debate calling a ratifying convention. He would wait to do this until December, when travel to the southeast would be the most difficult, unless of course you were already living in the southeast where the population leaned federalist. As expected, when the legislature met, the Eastern Assemblymen arrived and got a quorum before many Northwesterners could make the long journey down. The Federalists present voted to call a convention to be held in Exeter. They deliberately scheduled it for after the Massachusetts Convention, hoping that they could capitalize on some of the success there. They also kept the number of delegates down to favor the East. The legislature also sent copies of the Constitution to all towns eligible to send delegates. The result was not good. Out of 100 eligible towns, 26 told their delegates to vote against the Constitution no matter what the debate said. Only four Federalist towns told their delegates to ratify unconditionally. The day the convention began, John Sullivan kept the assembly, which had moved to Portsmouth, in session for an extra day. This just happened to overlap with the first day of the convention, and they just happened to be discussing a topic of great importance to some of the Westerners, who also just happened to be delegates to the convention. While many critical delegates were away in Portsmouth, the Federalists elected Sullivan presiding officer and passed a crucial rule for the convention. A motion to adjourn the convention would take precedence over any other vote. This was the Federalists' nuclear option. If things looked like they weren't going their way, they could force a vote to adjourn and schedule a convention at a later date. Over the next few days, the rest of the delegates arrived, and the debates commenced. New Hampshireites had similar problems with the Constitution as Massachusetts had. Congress's broad taxing powers, the state's reduced powers, a ban on producing their own currency, and the ability for non-Protestants to hold federal office were all hotly debated. The difference between New Hampshire and Massachusetts was that the New Hampshire Convention was debating fast. In just over a week, they had blown through all seven articles, and it looked like the debates were coming to a close. They had convinced several delegates in the debates, but they still didn't have the numbers to ratify. They decided to pull the plug. The convention took a vote on whether or not the convention should adjourn for a future day. It narrowly passed by 56 voting for adjourning, 51 against. So on February 22nd, the convention adjourned. 
ending New Hampshire's attempt to ratify the Constitution, at least for now. Federalists did their best to spin this as a victory, or at least as a tactical retreat. 56 people voting to adjourn meant that there were at least a few people that wanted to hear a little more debate on the Constitution before voting on it. Still, this could be looked at as one of the first anti-Constitution victories in the entire debate. Sullivan, who had been, let's say, optimistic about the Constitution's chances in New Hampshire, had severely exaggerated its support to Madison and Washington. And if they were looking for another quick victory to wash the bad taste out of their mouth, they weren't going to get it. Because Rhode Island was up next. 